We have arrived at our last panel. We're starting a little early so we can leave. It's been a long day, but um, please hold on uh, because I know this is going to be um, an especially good uh, panel. The topic is reporting on the occupation, and perhaps, uh, as many of the journalists here know, this is one of the toughest. If the war was tough reporting on, the occupation has been even tougher. And Elizabeth Farnsworth, who is a special correspondent with the News Hour with John, um, with Jim Lair, sorry, will be our moderator. Thanks. Thanks everybody for sticking around for this. We're going to talk about what's happening in Iraq today. First, let me introduce our panelists. Robert Collier is our own San Francisco Chronicle senior foreign affairs correspondent. He's reported from Iraq almost continually since the beginning of the war last year. He's also reported from many other countries, including Iran, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Central America. Mark Danner is a professor of journalism here at UC Berkeley. He's been since 1990 a staff writer at The New Yorker and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He also co-wrote and helped produce two hour-long documentaries for the ABC News program, Peter Jennings Reporting. He spent three weeks in Iraq in October and November for the New York Review of Books. Theola Labe is a Metro reporter for the Washington Post. She went on special assignment in Iraq for three months in 2003, covering the U.S. military and post-war conflict. She's also written for Publishers Weekly, the Detroit Free Press, Newsday, and the Albany Times Union. She's a Berkeley Journalism School graduate. Hania Mufti runs the Human Rights Watch office in Baghdad. She was in northern Iraq, Kurdistan, for Human Rights Watch during the war and has been in Iraq ever since, with the exception of a couple of weeks off. She's investigated and written about a whole range of human rights issues, including the expulsion of ethnic minorities in Kurdistan. She's investigating the administration of justice, among other issues now. Ed Wong has been a correspondent for the New York Times in Iraq since November. He left in early February for a break and will likely return in mid-April. He was previously a business reporter for the Times, and he, like Theola, got a master's in journalism here at Berkeley. He also got a master's in international and area studies. Ed, what's happening in Iraq today? And put it in some context for us. Um, I, well, today, if you saw the news, there's there, were, um, there was a big bombing at a hotel called the Mount Lebanon Hotel in Baghdad. And um, I think the initial reports placed the number of people killed at 27, and then uh, the military revised that number down to seven um, in some of the wire stories uh, recently. And there were, in the southern city of Basra, there are also three um, journalists who were Iraqis who were killed in a drive-by shooting, and nine were injured. And, that, and these journalists were apparently working with um, a TV station that was um, that was funded by the American occupation. Actually, I'm sorry, that's not in Basra. That was in Bakoba, which is a town around an hour's drive northeast of Baghdad, and it's a town that sort of um, that has a lot of elements that are unfriendly to the occupation. And then, um, just to, I left Iraq in late February, and in the couple weeks since then. Um, I was told when I left Iraq that I should just chill out and take a small break and not pay attention to what's going on, but I couldn't help myself. And every day I go on to the sure. web and I read stories and I contact some of my colleagues to find out what's going on there. And um, just in the last week or 10 days, some of the, uh, um, this is just a small piece of what's going on in Iraq, but um, in what's been dominating the news coverage, um, the, there's been a litany of, um, of deaths and injuries taking place there and um, including two American civilians working with the CPA, as well as their interpreter were killed in drive-by shooting. Two European contractors were killed in drive-by shooting. Four American missionaries were killed. And, um, and a little while before that, an interpreter working for the Voice of America and his, um, and his mother, I believe, were killed, as well as possibly his child in a drive-by shooting. So that's just like a very, and that, that leaves out a lot of other attacks and also leaves out a lot of other news going on in Iraq. But um, the reason why I wanted to list these particular incidents was because it points to one of the issues that journalists confront as soon as they enter Iraq right now, which if you were at the LA Times panel the other night, um, Tracy Wilkinson pointed it out, which is 
even, like by deciding to go into Iraq, then you, almost every day you're making a decision on how to stay alive, basically, or how to minimize your chances of getting killed or getting injured. And she, was, she brought up the example of even the choice of how you decide to enter Iraq, whether you fly in and risk getting shot, risk the plane getting shot with a missile. And there's been around three planes that have been shot um, with missiles, though none have been brought down. Or you risk driving through a highway, like the highway between Amman and Baghdad, which is a 13-hour drive. And it goes through um, what's arguably the most violent part of Iraq right now, which is the Fallujah Ramadi area. And, um, and there's a high rate of attacks and incidents on that in that area. So um, part of what the difficulty, I think, of reporting on the occupation is dealing with the security issue. And on, on one level, it's a practical issue because you have to figure out how you even get out to do your reporting and you make a judgment call on whether you um, you go out to cover a, cert a bombing or whether you go out to talk to certain people and whether, and whether the risks are worth, um, are worth it. And then on, an, on a, another level, then you have to be aware of how the measures you're taking might or might not affect the way you're covering your story and, and affect the perception that you yourself have of Iraq and of what's going on in Iraq and try and balance that out. And we're going to talk about that as each of these journalists talks about the stories that they covered and what they, what they had to do to cover them. But I want to stay with the news today for a minute. You notice, and you all know from reading the news, that, that people that work with journalists and with other Americans, uh, I mean with Americans who are working in Iraq are being covered and many Iraqis who are working with Americans are being covered both. What I want to know first from you, Ed, and then from you, Hania, is how is this affecting your local staff? the people that you depend on for interpreting and everything else? Well, I know that right now um, on our staff as well as on the staff of other big news organizations in Iraq, there's dialogue going on about what kind of risks the Iraqi staff are exposing themselves to when they work with us and sort of what our responsibilities are to them and what kind of um, issues they need to bring up with us or should bring up with us about, you know, about their own perceived safety. Uh, measures and I think some of these issues started popping up after um, the voice of Amer the killing of the voice of American interpreter was publicized and um, and even before that in Fe I think it, either in early February or January there was an incident that happened um, with the Washington Post in which an interpreter working for the Washington Post um, had his home bombed and his family and he escaped unscathed. But there were flyers littered around the scene um, saying, warning against working with Americans. And then the Washington Post later saw that their house was being videotaped um, by people in a sedan. And they decided to evacuate the house and move into the Sheraton Hotel, which has, is heavily fortified. It's got American tanks as well as large concrete blast walls surrounding it. Um, and they've basically left their house. And they, uh, I know recently they were debating whether to go back to their house, and they uh, went back and took a look around the area, and they saw that they were still being surveyed. They found out that the house is still being surveyed, and right now, I think they're still based in the hotel, um, and that brings up a whole new level of what kind of protection you need around, even around the places where you're living, um, and then... What kind of protection do you have around where you're living? In the New York Times house? We have... We're right next to the Sheraton. We're a few houses down from the Sheraton Palestine Hotel Complex. And when I first got there, which was in late, late November, we basically had a small contingent of armed guards. And we had sandbags around the front of our house. And since th there was a slow evolution over the three months I was there, in which they started erecting 10-foot um, high concrete blast walls around the house. Um, and they. Um, and then we started up a more regular rotation of guards, I believe. And so it, the house right now resembles a mini fortress. And that, partly that brings up the debate of whether you want to um, have a hard, sort of a hard security um, setting or whether you want to have a softer, more, less pronounced security setting. Okay, I want to talk about that and especially in the questions, I hope you'll raise the questions about journalists going armed too. Before I ask Connie about her staff, Theola, since we mentioned the Washington Post, tell us how you were protected and what you know about how your staff people are doing there now. 
It's such a beautiful house. It really pained me to learn that um, we left it, but obviously security trumps any sort of nostalgia. Um, we also had armed guards. Um, I think that um, personally, our I know that my philosophy, and, and I think overall at the Post as well, is that if you, you know, sort of went in Rome, do as the Romans do, and so, you know, we would travel in cars that looked just as beat up as the cars that other um, Iraqis drove, and our house was just another house on the block. We had armed guards out front, but nothing concrete, nothing really hard, and um, it's such an interesting place because everything changes so quickly and it was likely inevitable that something that was good um, would sort of eventually come to an end. And so there comes a time when your house is, when you don't have barriers out in front of it, it's just a house and so maybe you're okay but then when people decide one day to start taking photos then you're not okay. So you sort of have enough time until someone else sort of decides for you, okay, your time is up, let's now bomb a translator who works for you, let's now start taking photos of, of the house. I mean, I can tell you that when I was there, that was not the case, and um, we did not have those kinds of concerns. I was there from August of 2003 until mid-November, but there was always a discussion about um, how will the narrative change? Um, in terms of um, security, the narrative really was um, Iraqis who are unhappy about the occupation are trying to kill soldiers, and then increasingly they, they are trying to kill civilians who, who in some way to them support the occupation. So um, whether that's people at the UN, it started out sort of official targets, embassies, the UN, and then it sort of started ticking down and down to now translators and kind of civilian contractors. And now I think it's going lower to Iraqis who work with Western publications. And so then, then the question becomes, how far down will it go? Will they then say, you know, this is not good enough, let's get a real live journalist? Hani, has anybody quit among the staff that work with you at Human Rights Watch or among the various groups you, you rely on and work with to gather the kinds of information that you gather? Uh, I think um, the same issues that Ed raised or Theola apply to us, although I'm the only non-journalist on the panel, but we face many of the same issues. Um, no, nobody's quit, and we're, we're not quitters. Um, we'd like to um, stay in Iraq as... Uh, as long as possible because there's a lot of work to do there. Um, we are the only international human rights NGO that has stayed there throughout. Um, we'd like the others to come in also, um, although uh, making that decision is not an easy one. Uh, it's not an, it wasn't an easy one for us to decide that we were going to stay on after it was clear that the security situation had deteriorated dramatically. Um, we take some of the same precautions, um, you know, try to blend in as much as possible. Um, there was a time when it was useful, right after the fall of um, the previous government, when it was useful to go around saying we were Human Rights Watch. Um, that's no longer the case. Uh, it's much uh, safer now to travel as um, low-key as possible. Um, we've taken down the sign from outside our office. Um, we don't have any stickers or anything like that. Um, we don't advertise uh, where we are. Um, we, uh, the permanent staff that we have in Baghdad now are two people, myself and uh, one Iraqi employee. Um, but we do have uh, colleagues and consultants and others who do come in um, on a fairly regular basis from our offices in New York or DC or elsewhere uh, to work on specific projects that we, for you know, two weeks, three weeks or more, um, depending on what we see the priorities are for our work. Uh, and the same security considerations apply to them, obviously. Uh, it's, a, it's a big responsibility um, for me personally because, um, you know, you have to have, as Ed said, a constant assessment and reassessment on a practically daily basis of what the situation is security-wise and what you can do and what you can't do. So if there is a decision um, to um, devote some more time and resources 
uh, to a particular issue that we think needs attention and somebody is uh, flown in from the outside, it is based to a large extent on an assessment that I will have to make about whether it's safe enough for them to come, can they actually do what's being asked for them, where should they stay, uh, what route to take, um, and you know, the constant worry is, well, uh, what if I get it wrong? So it's an ongoing process. We have a lot to talk about, but I'm staying on the security because it gives you a sense of how hard it is to do what these journalists have to do. And Tracy Wilkinson at the LA, of the LA Times in an event the other night said, it's about 100 times harder to write an article. And it's one reason that Americans aren't getting everything they should be getting about the occupation. It's not just you know, failures of individual will or something. It's very difficult to do. I want to stay on this a little longer. And another, and I think Ed was starting to report this, but, and maybe you said it and I missed it. Um, the hotel I stayed at in Basra in May was bombed today. The bomb went off right outside the Meribad Hotel, a place many, many journalists stay. Several people were killed. It, the situation is very bad. And Mark Danner wrote in his New York Review of Books article after he was there, Security underlies everything in Iraq. It's the fault line running squarely beneath the occupation and the political world that will emerge from it. So before I leave, leave this, this whole security question, I want Mark to say something about how he sees it now and how it affected him, and then Robert to say something too. And they'll keep coming back to it because it is, it is the most sort of present fact that we all face there. Well, I'm glad you started with this, because I think it's not only one of the most present facts, it's also one of these absolutely critical concerns, much of which is kind of obscured by the journalist's own shadow, if you want to think of it that way. You're talking about the daily uh, performance of a job, and much of what you've just heard is not, and is not, reported. Um, I worked, I parachuted in for the New York Review of Books, uh, which gave me the opportunity to do a fairly longer, more commentary-filled uh, story. But I also spent a good deal of time as a consultant for CBS, uh, traveling around, CBS News 60 Minutes, traveling around with them. And they have, uh, partly for insurance reasons, uh, like many um, uh, television networks, they have, I think, four security guards. Um, Pilgrim, from the Pilgrim Security Organization out of Great Britain. These guys are ex-SAS fighters, Special Air Service. They're elite troops. They look like military guys. Um, they travel armed with little satchels in which they're, you know, uh, taking with them their automatic weapons. And when you roll into town with these guys in, in an SUV or several SUVs, if you roll into Fallujah with them, you look like you have armed people with you. And it's... Um, uh, on the one hand, you might feel slightly safer, but on the one hand, you might, on the other hand, you might feel rather more vulnerable. I mean, I did both. I went in with uh, CBS and their security people, and then went in myself simply with a translator and, and an old beat-up car of the sort that Theola was talking about. And I felt you get a lot more work done when you go by yourself, but you also take the risk not only that you might get killed, but that people will say after you're killed that you were really stupid. Um, <laughs> which is kind of what the worst of all possible worlds. Um, <laughs> the other thing to point out here, I think, is that the security people have a say in the way reporting is done by their nature. They are able to say, look, we're in Fallujah now, we have to leave by four o'clock. And you might be in the middle of a great interview, and they will just pull that cord and you have to go. I was in a convoy of, uh, of troops, of 82nd Airborne people, uh, trying to find IEDs, improvised explosive devices, which are the main way that American uh, soldiers certainly are still killed in Iraq. And I was going along in this armored uh, personnel carrier with you know, my um, uh, flak jacket and helmet and so on, trying not to seem like a complete geek while these guys are talking about the IED, how to get to it. They're sending troops out to circle this thing to try to see if uh, there are any people, I mean, usually there are uh, people hidden uh, just behind where the IED is gonna be activated who shoot at the convoy once they blow someone up. And I was listening and trying to record this stuff and it's very tight quarters. And all of a sudden I heard this horn honking, honking, honking persistently. I turned around and there was the SUV from CBS News, and the, the producer waving at me and the security guy waving at me shouting, you have to come back now. And I had to say to this, uh, uh, I guess it was a lieutenant, as I remember, uh, sorry, I have to get out. And I heard him say over the radio, uh, the journalist wants to get out. You know? <laughs> Which is 
slightly, slightly embarrassing. I, the other thing I think to say right at the beginning here is one doesn't really get a sense because it's such a, there's such a dramatic pace of spot news and explosions and so on of how security which I call the fault line beneath the whole reconstruction effort, if you want to call it that, how it dominates the scene in certain parts of Iraq. The capital itself is, uh, you know, Theola described uh, briefly what the Sheraton looks like. It's surrounded by tanks. It has these enormous concrete blast walls called Berliners after the Berlin Wall, because that is what they look like. Everywhere there are these huge baskets of dirt called Haskos, these bar barriers of all kinds everywhere. And some of the streets in the city, some of the main streets are surrounded and lined with these blast walls. So it looks like you're driving down a uh, stone tube. And huge parts of Baghdad have disappeared, in effect, behind these, uh, behind these walls. You are searched, if you're going to appointments with people and so on, you are searched five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a day, body searches. Your cars are searched. This is a constant part um, of doing business in Baghdad, certainly. And in Fallujah, you're searched a fair amount, but you're also uh, at the prey, as I suggested at the beginning, of your security. Um, uh, we'll, finally, we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, can I make one? Yeah, go ahead. The, the last point I was going to make, and I'm sure we will come back to it, is that there is simply a tremendous amount of violence in Iraq that isn't reported. Um, daily, daily violence. Um, some of it political, some of it not, uh, but that simply doesn't get into the news uh, at all. And I'm what not sure it's example, because of bad reporting. Examples. Sorry? Examples. Um, you know, I was going to use an example, but Theola is sitting here, and she actually reported this story briefly. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we were in, coming out of Fallujah again. We were in. A, we were going back to Baghdad. We had to leave early because of this. Uh, because of the security guards, uh, several of their opinion that we had to be off the road by dark. A convoy came up behind us. Two SUVs of civilians. We were stopped at a roadblock. There had been an attack there. Uh, we were stopped at a roadblock. These guys decided, these two cars behind us, SUVs, decided to turn around and try to get around the roadblock. They went back about. They turned around about three minutes later. We heard an enormous explosion. We rushed back. Uh, they were maybe a kilometer away. And there were bodies all over the road, three dead at that point, a couple of flaming. The vehicles we had just seen were in flames, uh, completely shot up. And American troops on the ground firing into the, uh, uh, into the hedgerows, if you call or into the palm trees, I suppose. Um, you know, it was very hard to figure out what was going on. Shots were coming in. Um, it turned out that five, I believe five civilians were killed, um, and an IED had gone off, but after a long, I mean, Theola may have a comment on this, but after a long investigation, it took several days, it turned out that the civilians were killed by American troops, that the Americans had heard the explosion go off, they turned, these civilians were beside the convoy, one of them apparently had a cell phone, was speaking on a cell phone or a walkie-talkie, and they immediately opened up on these civilian vehicles. Uh, and the Americans basically, you know, killed these guys. I mean, it was an accident. Uh, they didn't intend to, or they thought they were, well, it depends what your definition of an accident is, I guess. Uh, but that story was hardly reported here. It was briefly on the front uh, in the Washington Post, very briefly. Okay, Robert Collier, on one, uh, short, briefly on the security question and how it affected you and what you did about it. Well, the Chronicle is a much smaller operation than the Post or the networks, and we have a much smaller footprint. There, we never have any more than, or in the past year, well, since May, we've not had any more than one person on the ground in Iraq at the same time. So when I go, I, I'm just one person there, and I generally believe in such situations that less is more. Uh, I've, I've believed this ever since I was reporting in Central America in the 1980s. Uh, I never wear a bulletproof vest except when I'm in an American military convoy uh, because I believe that really the less protection you have, the more protected you are, uh, at least as an individual. Now, the Chronicle, again, does not have the high public profile of the Washington Post, which a foreigner might, who doesn't know how the U.S. press works, might think is a government press organ or propaganda organ or something like that and want to blow it up because of it's Washington. Well, the San Francisco doesn't have the same profile, so we're safer. No, we're, we're, we're so I go around sort of uh, very innocently in, in, in Iraq keeping my 
eyes and ears peeled very wide open. Uh, but again, by myself with my translator and my driver in a beat up car, uh, staying the heck away from US military convoys on the road uh, and staying away from US checkpoints and anything else that would be a target. And I stay in a hotel that has blast barriers, but no American troops around it, no troops of any sort. And uh, anyways, that, that's uh, my means of operation. Okay. I'm going to go to each one of these journalists and to Hania now and, and mention a story that I found particularly good among the many clips I read and have them tell us the story. I think we're here partly to learn about what's happening in Iraq and then how they got it and the problems they had getting it. Each story says something about the occupation, which is what we're supposed to be covering here. Ed Wong, your February 9th story <clears throat> on private armies. Here's the lead sentence. Several of the biggest political parties in Iraq say they are determined to keep their well-armed militias despite American opposition to the idea. Briefly, what was the story? What, what were the problems in getting it? What's the context? What does it tell us about the occupation? Um, this is actually, I didn't find this that difficult a story to report, even though initially I thought it might be. But um, the story essentially says that a lot of the major political parties in Iraq, from the two major Kurdish parties to Ahmed Chalabi's um, Iraqi National Congress, um, to um, the uh, Skiri, which is the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. It's a, a Shiite party that was in exile in Iran for a little while. But um, the fact that they had retained these armed militias, even though the US has said repeatedly since um, it took over Iraq that it doesn't want armed militias and that it will not tolerate them, and that they have, in the words of the spokesman there, that they have no place in the new Iraq. Um, and the fact is that the US had not put out an order telling these parties to disarm their militias, um, even though they had said this over and over. And the parties, and at first when I started reporting the story, I thought that it would be difficult to get the parties to open up a little bit about these. But it turned out that actually they were very, um, they were, in most cases, they were pretty forthcoming about the fact that they still had, had their um, armed people and that they wanted to keep them around because the security situation was still so untenable. That was the re rationale that they gave. And that, in fact, some of them have suggested to me that their security personnel should be used to guard certain areas that the U.S. was failing to protect, including streets of certain cities like Basra or Baghdad. They are being used in some cases, Right, aren't and they? they are. And for example, even when um, Lakhdar Brahimi, the um, U.N. Special Envoy, went down to talk to Sistani, when he went to the holy city of Najaf, the people who were surrounding him as bodyguards were members of the Badr Brigade, which is the militia that belongs to Skiri. Um, which is kind of a strange scenario because then it brings up issues of, um, you know, where the UN's allegiance is and what its its own particular ties are to some of these politicians. But, um, but and then in a lot of the South, a lot of um, Shiite groups do have armed people, and one of their um, right now what's going on in a lot of southern cities is one of the ways that they're vying for power influence in the cities is to boast of how much security they can provide to the people and whether our group can provide more security than the Americans or than another Shiite, um, conservative Shiite party. Um, and then up in the north, the Kurds are intent on keeping their Peshmerga. Um, and if you look at the history of what's happened in Kurdistan, then um, one could argue that you can't really blame them for wanting, for being suspicious of what kind of um, racism or chauvinism might still emerge in the future that would lead to persecution or killings of Kurds because a lot of their history is sort of steeped in that. And, um, and with the instability of the political situation in the country, then they're quite open about saying we want to keep our uh, militias around. Um, a couple of weeks after I reported the story and after it ran, um, the parties became much more open about um, keeping them. And they even had press conferences where they said we want to keep these um, armies around. Um, after the big bombings in Karbala on Ashura, which is a holy Shiite day, but after the big bombings there, then the party said, well, clearly the Americans can't protect the Iraqis, and these militias are needed more than ever. And the next day at the funerals there in, in Najaf and Karbala and various other cities, it was um, the Badr Brigade had people with AK-47s marching around the funerals and um, apparently uh, just making the presence known there. So 
Um, and the impetus for the story is fairly obvious. I mean, you go around Iraq and you see these people everywhere. Um, the most obvious ones are the Peshmerga because when you're up in Kurdistan, you see these, um, the Peshmerga in their baggy um, olive or brown uniforms with their Kalashnikovs everywhere in the streets. And, um, and so you realize that there's an obvious disconnect between what the CPA is saying and what's actually going on the streets. Um, and then the other impetus for it was that um, as Ambassador Wilson said yesterday, there's a lot of talk right now of the potential for civil war. And so you want to look at what the potential building blocks are for um, civil conflict. And one of them is if there are, if various political factions retained armed elements. I think that's, it's important to note that. And what was the tie with the Ministry of Interior in that article? Well, the Ministry of Interior, I mean, the, in the article I mentioned that the Iraqi National Accord, which is another exile group, um, that is an arrival to the INC that they had a militia at one point and that they had um, supposedly disarmed their militia over the summer when uh, Bremer ordered the disarming of the militias. But, um, but I noted that they run the in, uh, Ministry of the Interior, which in effect controls a lot of the domestic security forces right now in the country, including the police and the border patrol. And so it's a gray area on whether or not they officially have a militia or not. I mean, they run, they essentially control, this one party controls a lot of the armed forces right now in the country. Theola Labe, I'm looking at your November 29th, facing the horrific every day. Here's the lead sentence. The patient was talking, a couple of sentences. He had arrived one recent, I can need my glasses. The patient was talking. He had arrived one recent Saturday night at the 28th Combat Support Hospital, bare chested and bleeding from wounds in both legs in the emergency room when his voice rose above the din of the machines and medical staff, it was a good sign. Um, I should go on to say uh, the patient ends up being a soldier and that story is about um, 48 hours. You gotta hold this or it'll fall. No, it's <laughs> take it off this. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then that story is about um, two days inside of the main um, hospital in Baghdad where soldiers who are wounded and killed go to. So this is the, um, basically the trauma room, the um, receiving center. Um, I was struck in the panel by the Arab press earlier today. It seemed that what they were talking about and sort of criticizing was, was the understanding of Western media and sort of how they thought about Iraq and how they thought about the war because as a journalist, your understanding of the situation, that's your personal guidance that you then operate from and then that's what you draw upon to ask the questions. And so I'll sort of talk about my understanding which was, um, you know, specifically really none um, about the region but um, you know, I, I sort of have this analogy about kind of um, kindergarten art when you go into a classroom and see the kind of, you know, hands, you know, painted sort of on these like um, pieces of paper. When you look at a hand, you know, you see fingers, but, you know, you wouldn't see a picture of a hand like this. You sort of see it like this. And so there have to be spaces in the hand to sort of, f for there to be a hand. And so, um, the way that I am sort of drawn to situations is that I'm always interested in the spaces because um, what you see about Iraq is sort of this litany of bombings and news and that's everything that, you know, we all know and that we can see. And what kind of drew me to the hospital was that it was a place that I couldn't see. It, it was a place that no one could see. Um, the military is actually very good about giving you information about soldier casualties. Sort of every day, several times a day, they will send out emails. You know, dateline uh, to Crete dash. You know, a soldier from the 4th Infantry Division was killed today when his armored personnel vehicle was riding over a, you know, and it goes on. I mean, very dry language about six lines. And I would always see in these releases, you know, the soldiers were taken to the, to the 28th Combat Support Hospital for treatment period, and then it sort of go on. And sort of one day, you know, towards the end of my stay there, because again, sort of with time, you can sort of start to put together a picture. 
I just sort of sat there one day and said, well, w what is this hospital? Like, where is it? Like, who's there? Kind of what happens there? If this is the place where everyone goes to, then I want to go there. Um, um, there, the uh, press operation is very organized and I sort of put in my official query and um, the only trouble was that it was that, you know, someone promising to help me and then them sort of, fall, you know, just sort of falling through, not through any malice, but maybe because they were too busy or just whatever. And then you sort of ask someone else and then they say, oh no, you can't do that. And I say, well, whatever, you just obviously ignore that person. And then, um, you know, other things happen. There's more bombings and you think, oh, don't have time to hang out at the hospital, gotta go, you know, do this. And finally, you know, I figured out that I, you know, months before had met the person who was the right contact. So I said, you know, I sort of, I'm like tearing through notes and I find this person and I send them an email and they say, sure, come on by. And I say, wow, was that easy, right? <laughs> I'm sort of waiting for someone else to sort of set it up and then in the end I set it up. And um, it, it was a hospital that, that was the private clinic of um, Saddam Hussein and it had, um, it was just very, it, it was very nice. It was two floors. It had lots of expensive equipment. There was this x-ray machine that in, that would tell you in Arabic, you know, bend your head and all these other things. And um, I found with this story that once I got inside, once I was inside this hospital, this place that really no other journalist had sort of been to um, since the war, since after the war, any time, that I could just go anywhere and do anything. And what did you see? Um, I was, I got there in the morning and the ER, surgeon was was a guy from Walter Reed in DC so there was sort of instant rapport there and at first I really saw nothing um, you know he was just sort of talking to his staff you're just sort of waiting you're just sort of doing whatever and then we had dinner and then you know sometime that night you hear this chop chop and then you sort of see everyone kind of starting to do things and you think okay um, the bird is here. The bird that has a soldier is here. And so everyone just starts sort of, you know, just doing these things that, that they do, snapping on gloves, going outside, waiting for the stretcher to come in. Um, these two guys get into a sort of golf cart and they strap on a helmet and then they drive off. And, you know, this is the first time that I'm seeing this. And so as a journalist, you know, you always have this instinct to ask questions like, well, what's happening? What's going on? And, you know, I really fought that in this case. Um, I really felt, I, I really saw myself as, as a camera almost, as if I was, you know, 48 hours or something. And I was just going to stand there and then just watch and sort of write down as much as I could. And that um, maybe, Maybe I wasn't going to get it, maybe I was, but I couldn't worry about me. I had to sort of watch this thing. And so the soldier came in, you know, you, you clear, clear, I sort of saw more naked bodies in my time there and sort of, um, I can recall. And so, you know, someone comes in, you know, no, no, no uniform, just sort of nothing. And, and he gets wheeled into the ER and they take off his helmet and it becomes very clear that, that, that you know, that's where the injury is. You know, there's some brain matter. There's obviously a very serious wound above his ear and they start working on him a little bit, but then it's just, and then all of a sudden they just stop, you know? And then I was, I'm thinking, okay, I, you know, and then someone sort of cursed, so I said, okay, I, I guess the person's dead now. And so then this is then the sort of now he's dead moment. And then um, I remember all I did was sort of very briefly kind of tap this doctor who I kind of had chatted up earlier in the day and just said, hey, you know, what are you thinking now? And he just kind of said, you know, it's always tough, you know, when it's, when, when it's one of us, but you know, I can't think about this person for too long because then I have to worry about someone else. Um, and then actually what happened was um, there was another soldier coming in in about two minutes. And, but then this soldier 
was alive. And he was sort of talking, and that's the lead, him sort of saying, you know, the patient was talking, and that, you know, when they're talking, it's a good sign. And then I, I could sort of see in the doctors just their change of mood, because he was sort of joking with them. And, um, and just in that instance, you know, I felt the absolute burden just to be there and to stay there, and to see as, as much as possible, because, um, I think you had asked the question, what does this story tell us about the occupation? The story of the wounded soldier continues to be one of the most underreported stories going on. Um, I say, you know, I, I emphasize one of, not the most, but just one of. Um, because it's just very hard to see that. We see the bomb blast, we see the concrete, we see the bodies in the hospital of the Iraqis. We even see wounded Iraqis, but we don't see wounded soldiers. How many people went through in the, what, 36 hours you were there? How um, many people? That's a good question. Um, I, think, I think it was about a dozen soldiers. And what was so interesting to me was that incidents that I would see as a press release, I now was seeing in real time. And then I then went back and sort of found the press releases sort of describing what happened. And I thought, gosh, that's not even close, because there I am talking to the guy telling me what happened the minute that their truck exploded. Robert Collier. I don't have the first line of your story with me. You did, among your other stories, a long piece for the American Prospect that aired earlier this month. It was a very interesting story because I hope you'll tell us why you were there and what you were doing. Somebody comes up to you in full Iraqi army dress. Tell us about that story and what you learned from it. Well, I was in the city of Samarra, which is about 80 miles or so north of Baghdad in the Sunni Triangle uh, that morning there had been a big shoot-up involving U.S. Uh, troops, and the U.S. had first it claimed it had killed 50-some, 40-some, you probably remember the story, uh, and it later wound up being that the U.S. didn't kill half as many as it claimed, had, it claimed to have killed. Anyhow, I, I wound up to Samara and just went tooling around with my translator and, and my driver go downtown asking, well, where was the attack? Where was the attack? And people point you this away, people point you that away. Nobody seems to quite know. But anyways, you finally find it. And so we're sitting there in front of the shrine. There's a big Shiite shrine in the middle of Samara, even though it's mostly a Sunni town. Uh, and that was where one of the various attacks was, or shooting inc incidents. And so I'm si sitting there interviewing, you know, Abdul citizen, and uh, you know these guys on the street, and a crowd forms, as usually happens when you're in any of these towns and sitting doing vox pop interviews on the street. A crowd of 30 or 40 people, 40 people gloms around you, and you start getting a little bit nervous because you know, crowd dynamics can be funny. But anyways, it was a very friendly crowd, uh, a lot of gesticulating and, and, and yelling, and very emotional uh, sort of testimonials but still a basically friendly vibe. And you've always got your, the vibometer is a very important thing to have when you're out doing Vox Pop and out on the street uh, because you never know when the street mood can change in an instant uh, and when, when you want to just get out of there. Uh, but anyways, so this was fine. And so I'm sitting talking with this crowd of 30 or 40 and then all of a sudden the crowd parts. And this guy walks up in an Iraqi army military, an uh, um, army officer's union uniform of the old Iraqi army. Uh, formal pressed uniform with an officer's winter coat uh, and the, the type of uniform that Iraqis do not wear and cannot wear. They would be arrested. They would be almost automatically arrested by the US troops if they're wearing that sort of uh, a uniform in a place where a, a, an attack had just been made uh, like that. So the crowd empties out around him. He walks up. He's a middle-aged man, about 50 years old, short buzz cut, very stockily built, air of authority, and starts into a rant with me about, he's first, first about Zionism and the Israel. And then I say, I let him go on for a while, but then I ask him the questions that I really had come to ask. And that was the subject of this article, and the subject of the article is essentially, what do 
the Sunnis want? What do the Ba'athists want? What do the guerrillas want? Because it seems to me that there never will be peace in Iraq unless there is some sort of addressing of the Ba'athist insurgency. You can solve it either two ways. One is by defeating it militarily, and the other is by co-opting it and including it. Uh, most major dom world domestic conflicts, internal civil conflicts in the world that have gone through peace processes have had as one of their key elements the inclusion and re-enfranchisement, re if you will, of the defeated party. In El Salvador, the FMLN was allowed to keep, you know, keep its party and run for office, win seats in parliament, win city halls, and now they're running neck and neck for the presidency in uh, elections this coming Sunday, I believe it is. Nicaragua, Guatemala, Angola, Mozambique, the Balkans, uh, take your pick. In most of these cases, you have the, the, the re-inclusion of the, the, the defeated party. Now we have the Ba'athists in Iraq. They're shooting at the Americans. They feel disenfranchised. Anyway, so I wanted to do a vox bop. And because you can't, you can't just go talk to the guerrillas. Nobody knows who the guerrillas are. Nobody knows how many guerrilla organizations there really are. Are there five? Are there 50? Are there 500? Uh, you, you don't know. It's not simply a faceless guerrilla entity, but f five hundred, hundreds of faceless guerrilla entities. Uh, so it's very hard to find an interlo interlocutor to interview. What do so, you say? What do you so say what he said, he so surprisingly you enough, uh, and somewhat logically, after his rant about Zionism and this and that and the other thing, he, he said, well, we want elections, but if and only if we are allowed to form our new party, get at least some of our leaders back out of jail because all, all their leadership is either in jail or the few that aren't are in hiding. Uh, we want a newspaper and he listed off a bunch of things that are kind of basic for uh, sort of civics 101 uh, in these countries uh, for a, a segment of the population to have. And I said, well, uh, what do you think of the elections plan or then the new American plan to choose a government via this very complicated caucus process. And he, as did many other radical Sunnis and Ba'athists whom I interviewed over, the next, over a period of several weeks in Samarra, Ramadi, Fallujah, and Baghdad, uh, he said, uh, we're opposed to it because we think it's a stacked deck. We are excluded. We are, he didn't use the word, but disenfranchised. And so anyways, I thought that was an interesting story. Now, the way you get that, again, is simply by happenstance and by just talking to people on the street. And then you sort of add up snippets. You conglomerate pieces of Vox Pop, and you talk to people whom, who you think, if not are involved with the insurgency, that at least are pretty darn close to it. Before I go on to Mark, you, you've re reported a lot from Central America and you speak Spanish, so you know what it is to speak the language of the place you're covering. How hard is it not speaking Arabic? Well, it's, it's difficult. I mean, having a translator is better than, better than nothing, but uh, it's, it's a huge, very long step away. Now, granted, depending on how good your translator is, but uh, you lose an awful lot. And uh, of course, one of the great shames of reporting about Iraq and the Middle East in general is how few of us uh, speak Arabic. Uh, Anthony Shadid of the Washington Post, uh, who is very deservedly a finalist for Pulitzer, uh, was one of the very, very few uh, who speaks Arabic among the Western press corps in Baghdad. And it helped him immeasurably. I mean, yeah. he's an excellent reporter to begin with and a very nice guy, but he also speaks Arabic, which is a big, big deal. I hope Hania will address this too, but let's go on to Mark first. Um, in Mark's December 18th New York Review of Books article, it's a very long story. I'm not going to read the lead sentence because being a, a, a long article, it, 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 go, it, it includes several topics in several cities. But I'll ask you, Mark, it, it begins with a description of the bombing of the International Red Cross headquarters. It's a very vivid, heartbreaking description. What was the most difficult aspect of covering the occupation for you in October and November? What was the hardest to get? 
Well, that particular, uh, the beginning to that story, um, I was simply driving on my way to an interview uh, with uh, actually the head, the general who ran intelligence at that time for Iraq, uh, American general, I mean, who so far as I know had not been interviewed. And I was very pleased with this and couldn't believe I had gotten it and was driving very early uh, to make sure I was there on time and can go through the various searches and, and uh, car searches and all the things that would be necessary to get to, uh, to her. And um, so we were driving along, the car suddenly lurched up into the air, um, as I describe in the piece, and fell down again. I didn't hear anything at first, and then suddenly heard the kind of tinkling of the, uh, of the window panes um, in the glass along Carada. Um, and realized there'd been a huge explosion and saw immediately the smoke and went rushing to this scene in a kind of adrenaline pumping uh, two minutes that I think reporters uh, in Iraq know very well. I mean, part of, I know the time spent with CBS, part of it is hearing an explosion running up to the roof and trying to identify where the explosion happened and trying to get there instantly, particularly television. And I found myself as one of one of the first two or three journalists there had no idea what this building was that was now consumed with uh, flames 12, 15 feet high, um, uh, in the middle of which were a couple of cars, the frames of a couple of cars, as if, you know, sort of insects preserved in amber, this very striking uh, image. And people running around, the facilities protection troops uh, running around frantically, not knowing where to point their guns, uh, and journalists arriving on the scene very quickly and setting up a line of cameras. Uh, and I describe in the piece how the American military, um, some soldiers showed up about 20 minutes after the explosion, I'd say, and started uh, pushing people back, essentially fighting the journalists and pushing them back in the crowds there, um, and just screaming, I'll you never forget it, um, get the fuck back, get the fuck back just like that, and pushing, pushing people back. And this crowd just pushing onto this fiery scene, knowing that this is going to be the huge story of the day. And I remember thinking, when I looked at these, these kids, because they're 20, 21 years old, um, you know, I heard a lot of them express contempt uh, for journalists, and especially some of their officers, essentially talking about the war and saying, you know, this is not a war. There are no division on division engagements. All there are are these ridiculous bombs, uh, which, I mean, this is not a war. And in effect, as one colonel told me, uh, these, the bad guys do their BDAs, battle damage assessments, uh, by watching CNN. Uh, so this notion that, you know, journalists, particularly television journalists, are in the pipeline between the bad guys and the achievement of their aims. Uh, when I asked the same colonel, what's the center of gravity of the enemy for the insurgents? In other words, the Clausewitzian notion of you find the enemy's center of gravity and destroy it. I said to this guy, who was a very, like many of the people I talked to, very well trained, very smart, um, uh, very thoughtful. Um, a planning officer, I said, what is the enemy's center of gravity? What's the American center of gravity for the Iraqi insurgents? And he said, the will of the American people, without hesitation. Uh, so they view the press as this central uh, part, this conveyor belt between the war that is not a war and the American people who are not convinced enough or are politically uh, not strong enough to carry the war on. Um, which makes reporting on it, I think, very interesting and, and problematic. Uh, to answer your question more directly about what was the di most difficult part to me, um, part one is trying to come up with, after all the criticisms about a distorted view, as President Bush said, of what's happening on Iraq, trying to come up with some kind of notion of what would be an undistorted view. In other words, what is the role of violence in this country? Um, and the second most difficult thing, I think, is trying to convey the sense of dispersed authority there. I mean, we're used to, as journalists, going to people with, you know, handles, people who have after their name a particular rank that gives them status within your story. Uh, one set of handles there is people who work for the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority. And to me, one of the uncovered stories, because it's not, strictly speaking, a story, is the CPA is kind of a black hole. 
uh, it's a black hole. You know, it doesn't, in a weird way, it doesn't exist. It is a thousand or two thousand Americans in a bunker, a bunker in the middle of Baghdad. Most of them, uh, I mean, when I say most, 90% of them never get out of that bunker. They work there, they sleep there, they take a bus from the palace of Saddam's where they work to the place where they're sleeping. And, um, uh, but because they're the American Occupation Authority, they get reported, uh, it's very hard to convey this, I think, uh, in news stories, the fact that in a strange way they're absent, and the American army, insofar as there's political work being done by Americans in Iraq, is doing that work. Um, but, and they're doing it to a lesser or greater extent. Uh, but actually, you cannot, as a member of the press, it's very difficult to get to these people in this bunker of Saddam's palace. Uh, it's very difficult to phone them up. Most of them don't have working telephones. Uh, you can get them on email. A lot of them won't talk to you. Um, it's, it is this, uh, this black hole, and when you finally get in, you walk into this palace where portraits of Saddam are covered with sheets and so on, and you find this bizarre world of these these kids, essentially, you know, late 20s, early 30s, uh, these American kids from Washington wearing chinos and uh, khaki shirts, carrying around clipboards, running back and forth, who know nothing about the Middle East and worked for some think tank or congressman back in Washington. And they're here supposedly running an Iraqi uh, ministry, and they've never been out in the city. It's quite, I kept thinking of, uh, I was trying to think, what does this remind me of? And I suddenly one day realized it reminded me of Poe's story, The Mask of the Red Death, in which people, you know, the elite trying to avoid this plague moves from castle to castle and finally into this absolutely isolated castle. And eventually, of course, at the end, the Red Death comes and actually, and actually gets them. And I thought of their isolation like that. But how do you convey that in a story? Because the rules of journalism say you have to quote the coalition provisional authority. What is that news? Coalition provisional authority, black hole. <laughs> okay, Mark, I'm gonna interrupt you there. You brought up two very interesting ideas I want everybody to talk about before I go to Hania about specifically the, what she's covering. And Hania, feel free. Anybody wanna comment on these two very interesting points? One, the CPA is the black hole, and second, the, the press insurgent, I don't want to say link, but the point you made about it being part of the funnel, trying to influence the American people. I know Theola has something to say first. I just have a sort of funny postscript to Mark's comments about the CPA. The military hospital is inside of this bunker, and so I finally get in, and I spend two days there, and I'm talking to, you know, I'm in a hospital talking to U.S. soldiers, and I'm going to dinner and eating these, you know, tea rats, they call them, rations, just really sort of bad food, and, you know, our time is up, and we're carrying our bags way, way out to the big, big gate that has lots of soldiers, and then we get outside, and we get in the car, and it was a hot night, so then we're driving home, and all the windows are down, and I can't tell you how strange it was to hear Arabic, and I had to kind of catch myself and say, oh, yeah, wait a minute, I am in a rock. Yes, of course. I spent these two days with these guys who were like dialing up on email and on laptops, but I am in Iraq now. And then I thought, second, I was, I was just gone for two days. These guys live there. So what is it like when they finally venture out for some day trip to go see how the water project in Baji is doing? I mean, they must be terrified. I mean, they're just so disconnected. I remember a press conference in the convention center in July when an NPR reporter, whose name I forget now, had the temerity to get up and say, well, uh, uh, Mr. Bremer, uh, you just said that everything is hunky-dory and everybody loves the CPA in, in Iraq, but we uh, have gone around done Vox Pop and uh, that's not the case. And Bremer immediately responded, well, that's just, that's what you want to say. That's what you want to hear. And the reporter stood up for himself and said, oh, excuse me, there's hundred or so other reporters here, you could ask them, and that's our experience uh, talking to people on the street, is there's a great deal of skepticism about the U.S. presence. And Bremer didn't want to listen to it. He was incredibly dismissive and essentially impugned the motives of that reporter and any other reporter who cared to think uh, in a similar manner and uh, said, next question. Uh, so that gives you just one little example of the, uh, the bunker mentality uh, that I think has plagued the American effort there and the fact that indeed for security reasons they can't just go like we do. 
go out wandering the streets and talking to people. Uh, so they are incredibly isolated. I would also just want to say that the, uh, uh, the CPA has the most dysfunctional and incompetent press operation that I've ever seen in my 17 years as a journalist. <laughs> now granted, they're better than they were, say, in, in the summertime. Uh, now they finally figured out what a, list, what a listserv is, and now they have a fairly efficient listserv, and they have br more or less regular briefings every couple days uh, of officials, which is really the only way of getting a hold of anybody, because I found, now granted, I'm, I'm lower on the food chain than, say, the Washington Post or CNN or the New York Times or, or Fox News, but still, I, I've invariably, when I send in my re interview requests or when I go physically to the press desk and ask for uh, in interviews, I mean, nothing ever happens. It is indeed a black hole. Uh, and the poor schmuck who's sitting there fielding these requests invariably just says to me in a very sort of sheepish tone, well, I'm sorry, they don't return our phone calls and they don't return our emails and I don't know how else to get a hold of them. So there's a huge amount of dysfunctionality happening within the whole CPA. Okay, Hani, uh, you wanted to say something about the CPA too. Hani is with Human Rights Watch, for those of you who came in late. She runs the Human Rights Watch office in Baghdad. Um, just to say that by contrast, our relationship with the CPA is um, a little bit different. I think maybe it's because they may feel less threatened by us than they do by the journalist who's going to write everything probably at that moment. Um, it's not perfect, but we do have um, fairly good access to those in the CPA that we need to see on a fairly regular basis, um, particularly those that cover human rights issues, uh, justice issues, and so on. Um, but I agree that they are a black hole as far as public perception is concerned, and I think the experience of journalists that we've uh, talk to on the ground, um, I think it's been fairly appalling for them in terms of the kinds of cooperation that they've had uh, and the kinds of increasingly bureaucratic restrictions that they are subjected to uh, in comparison. I think probably most of you will agree with me on this in terms of the media about how things have changed from the time that um, you know the war ended until today. Uh, there's a kind of st stark contrast. Um, and uh, Robert mentioned the other point I was going to say, which is uh, the media operation of the CPA. I think they would have done well to have attended this conference and assessed how they did um, in, in the war and in the aftermath of the war. Um, um, I usually don't attend um, most of the press briefings that they hold. I'm kind of spared that. And sometimes I don't go for security reasons, but um, we, uh, I think the, the key, I mean, there are two issues uh, on this. One is uh, how the CPA relates media-wise to the journalists on the ground, um, and also how it relates to the Iraqi public. And I think in the latter, uh, it has probably, I would say that this is its most, uh, single most, um, or worst failure in terms of, um, um, lack of post-war planning in terms of how they um, were able or not able to put their message across um, to the people of Iraq. Um, You're talking about the media operation specifically here? Media operation of the CPA. Uh, once the war was over and there was this thing called CPA, uh, they did not have a single effective means of talking to the people of Iraq about what they were about, what they intended to do, and so on. And that is still the case today, still even, still though, the case. even though when you talk to, Iraq, uh, to CPA officials, they do tell you, yes, we recognize that problem, but it's always somebody else's job to do that, and so far it hasn't been done. Um, you know, they have a, a daily newspaper which does not enjoy that wide circulation. They have a crappy <laughs> television station. Um, they had a... Um, a good success with uh, one of the radio stations they set up just before the war, but um, now it serves a different purpose. Uh, I think what people were, um, I think what would have helped um, uh, tremendously um, for Iraqis in general would be 
um, to have had uh, daily or weekly or regular briefings from the CPA through their television station, for example, about what was going on in terms of their daily lives. When was electricity going to be cut? What was happening? Uh, what's happening with the water? Uh, when are pensions going to be paid? Uh, what's happening to salaries? You know, just pure information uh, that would help Iraqis um, to regulate their daily lives, to plan for um, things that they needed to plan for, and this operation still does not exist. Until okay, today. now I know you all want to ask questions, and I'll leave plenty of time for that, but I'm going to ask Hania first and then ask each of you the following question. What is missing from the coverage, and why do you think that's the case? You probably know Iraq better than anybody here. You spent the most time. You speak Arabic. Um, you really know this situation. What are reporters missing, and why, in your view? Well, I think that's not fair, because you didn't give me a chance to say what I was doing there in the first place. Yes. Um, I, I was going to ask you that, too, but go ahead. Um, well, in order to say what was missing, um, I need to say the other one first. So can I do yes, that? Yes, do. OK. Um, well, uh, we have a, a kind of more long-term perspective as a human rights organization than, of course, the journalists who come in for um, you know, a specific period, they cover what's going on at that time. Sometimes they do features. Uh, we're in there for the long haul, and we've already um, been covering issues related to Iraq since before, well, for many years. So some of it is a continuation of what we've already done, and some of it will be new stuff. Uh, I think in a, any post-conflict situation, uh, um, the um, choice or the dilemma is how much uh, resources and time uh, and people do you devote to um, documenting um, what's been happening in terms of um, the crimes of a previous regime, such as that one of Iraq, versus what's happening there before your eyes in the new situation. Um, we've tried to balance the two. Um, how successfully we've done that, I think, um, you know, is a matter of opinion. But uh, for example, you're exhuming graves. You, you and Eric just were part of an exhumation of, of several thousand people, right, in the north? No, we were not exhuming graves. What, um, that was part, oh, may I say, first of all, that Human Rights Watch has been very lucky to have had Eric Stover come out on loan from Berkeley for free um, to work with Human Rights Watch on two occasions. He spent five weeks with me. Um, just before and during the war in the north, and then just last month he came out for a couple of weeks. And uh, whenever I go out there um, and I introduce him, he says to me, um, introduce me as a grave digger, <laughs> which I sometimes do. Um, so he went, uh, what we did um, in the last couple of weeks was to um, assess uh, the state of the evidence and the preparedness of that evidence ahead of the trials that will start nobody knows when, it could be very soon, could be later in the year, could be early next year, of uh, members of the former regime. Um, there are a number of sources uh, for that evidence. One of the principal ones is, of course, the forensic evidence that would come out once mass graves have been exhumed. Um, another source is the documents, original documents seized from Iraqi intelligence, security, Ba'ath Party offices, and the like. Uh, there are also, of course, the testimonies, testimonial evidence that will come from the victims and their families. And there, are, there is the information that uh, has been obtained under interrogation from uh, the suspects themselves, um, the deck of 55 and others who may be brought before that court. So we were looking at two of those sources of evidence, the forensic and the documentary, and um, came away with, uh, well, we already pretty much knew what the situation was, but we looked at it um, in a more um, uh, analytical way, and the picture doesn't look good uh, in terms of um, uh, what has been done to prepare the evidence for the trials. Um, it might You're so including Saddam Hussein and the per people to be tried, right? Yes, yeah. yes, I am. Although, um, technically speaking, he still has um, POW status right now, so uh, cannot be tried before the Iraq Special Tribunal that um, will come into being, but we understand that <coughs> his status, his legal status, will be um, reviewed and um, changed at the appropriate juncture. Um, but yes, we, we are looking, uh, and I think in answer to your question, uh, your original question, um, the whole story of what is going to happen to 
um, members of the former regime, what's happening with the evidence and so on, is something that is a big story that <coughs> has been missed by most of the media uh, that has been out there, whether Western media or Middle Eastern media or other media. Of course, it's been reported on in, in bits and pieces, like for example, once mass graves started being um, discovered in mid-May last year and families went and dug around and you all remember the images on television at that time, of course that was covered. And when Saddam himself was arrested, it kind of raised again the whole issue and also some of the other big names that were either arrested or surrendered um, in the preceding months. So it was covered, um, but not, not as a, a developing story. Um, and I think there are so many issues uh, that need to be looked at um, in this context that, that journalists never touched. And in a way, this story uh, started before the war. Um, in the lead up to the war, um, we were looking at uh, who might go uh, before a tribunal that might be set up. As a human rights group, we were calling for an international tribunal. There wasn't much support for that within Iraq. Um, nor even to a mixed tribunal uh, composed of both Iraqi and non-Iraqi judges who, who would hear the cases once the court was established. Nevertheless, um, uh, there were a number of issues that, we, that rang alarm bells for us even before the war. Um, I, I want to just slightly digress here by saying, it just gives me a reason for mentioning this. Uh, there were, <coughs> I don't know if you noticed uh, if you've been here this morning or yesterday, um, how many times um, some of the speakers mentioned Ahmad Chalabi as being one of the figures in, within the Iraqi political scene right now. Um, I'm fascinated by your fascination with Ahmad Chalabi. Um, I, whatever you think, and I'm not defending the guy, um, if you think he's a crook, uh, if you think he's sleazy, whatever, that's fine and it's perfectly okay. But I think more serious um, is um, a group of people who, to whom the U.S. allied itself, who, ought, uh, who have committed um, crimes that will be heard before the Iraq Special Tribunal. And this, has, this started in the run-up to the war. Um, you're talking about the INC committing crimes? No, no, I'm not talking about the INC. I'm talking about individuals. Uh, Ahmed Shalabi was mentioned in the context of being um, the protege of the neocons, of the Pentagon, and so on, which, of course, is the case. Um, but uh, no mention was made, for example, of uh, other individuals, Iraqi individuals, who are in positions of power in Iraq today, uh, or who are at liberty, uh, who were not supported by the Pentagon or the neocons, but were supported by CIA, continue to be supported by the CIA or State Department. And when we talk about uh, the U.S. administration, it's as if it's one entity, which of course it wasn't. There were many different factions within the U.S. administration, and I think that was one of the sources of the problems for the lack of post-war planning um, in Iraq. Uh, there were so many struggles and um, fights over, over who was going to call the shots in Iraq post-war. Um, and that's, that, uh, that is still continuing today. Uh, the point about saying this is that the story about bringing people to justice started before the war. There were a number of people, um, as I said, who are either at liberty in Iraq today or who are in positions uh, of power in Iraq today who committed crimes who ought to be held before a tribunal. Uh, these were people who were also supported by the U.S., um, ranging from a former chief of the armed forces to a former head of military intelligence to people who have themselves said that they participated in killings um, when the uprising happened in 91. Those people haven't been touched. They're at liberty in Iraq. That, sto that whole story has been missed by the media. And when the trials start, I hope that some of the journalists who will be out there covering it will start asking questions about why those people are not being indicted. Um, okay. Yeah. I, can, I know some of you have to go. We're going to go to questions now instead of going through each person with what's missing or what's really great about the coverage, but I think it'll come out in some of your questions. Um, who has a question? And remember that there, I think Rachel, if she's still here, has, no, it's not Rachel. You have a microphone, and Jonathan. Uh, let, me, let me say first that we've been uh, knocking around the American media for the last two days, and I've done it myself. 
I think with good reason, but what I've heard uh, here today uh, works to uh, restore my pride in our profession. So I want to thank you for that. Um, but what I want to ask, though, is, um, you know, very strikingly this morning uh, from Maher Ahmad, if I say it rightly, we heard, you know, mark my words, the trouble is just beginning. This is just the start of the trouble in Iraq. And I wonder uh, whether, uh, based on your experience, you think that's right or where things are heading. Did you ask somebody specifically? I didn't hear. Anybody. Anybody. Um, I think from what I've seen, the occupation is a lot more complicated than what the American officials had originally planned for. And I think that's obvious from the reporting that's gone on. But, um, and I think uh, from what I've seen in my three months here also that if the end goal of the U.S., if one of the main end goals of the neocons and the administration was to create a strategic state in the Middle East that's friendly to, the, to American interests, um, in the, either the short or the near-term future, then that's failing right now because of both popular sentiment on the streets, but also because of the desire of certain political leaders to sort of start distancing themselves from the American administration and, um, and sort of consolidating their own political power. And I think that these elements taken together um, have to be watched closely because I think that they could, in the... Um, in the run-up in the next few months to the so-called handover of sovereignty that these issues will emerge much more openly. I think that um, if you want to say that there's a beginning to things, um, then maybe this is, this is part of that. Elizabeth, could I, um, I, I agree with that, and I think um, uh, one of the interesting questions here is when do you go from call, how do you, what leads you to call things by the names that we in the press call them? I mean, right now the story is sovereignty, 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 but there's no real clue what exactly that means, what it's going to mean in June. The actual system that the Americans set down on November 15th after the Ramadan offensive for transfer of power has completely fallen apart. There's nothing to replace it. Um, and I, my view, together with the gentleman who spoke this morning is, is very dark. The question is, when do you begin to call something civil war? What exactly is a civil war? I have one other comment to make, which is that, you know, the security situation, we sort of said, given the security situation, the CPA can't get out, doesn't get out, has very little footprint in, in Baghdad and in the country. And of course, we take the security situation as a given, and I, you quoted my metaphor, the fault lines under the occupation is the security situation. But it's not like the weather, it's not a natural phenomenon. I think it's important to remember that one of the reasons for the security situation, which has determined everything else, including a lot of the political attitudes of the nascent Iraqi political polity, um, is the war, the way it was fought, and the, the small number of soldiers that were used. These were decisions that were made by Americans. They were decisions that were made by people. They're not nat natural uh, phenomena. And the security situation now, uh, the looting and what's going on now, is partly a phenomenon of the lack of troops, the lack of planning for the occupation, and the refusal in the end of the American administration to take on the political burden and the responsibilities of doing what it said it wanted to do. So I think that the interesting thing is going to be if this slips into sort of a low-level civil war, and I think Ed has explained very clearly that the elements of that are certainly there, and the desire of it on the part of Mr. Zarqawi, if you can believe his letter, is certainly there. Um, if that happens um, and the Americans um, sort of slowly slip away, when will we come to call it a civil war, and how many people here will actually be paying attention? Scott Armstrong. Two questions for whoever wants to deal with them on the uh, logistics of the occupation and the ongoing process, whether we need to do something vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between journalists um, and those of us that care about institutional memory uh, and the United States government. Question one, which came out of Honey's uh, comments, uh, after the Grenada invasion, the United States government captured all the documents, took them away, 
and they're not available. They're not considered go U.S. government documents. They're not available under the Freedom of Information Act. They're gone. You have Might no. Might I say Scott runs the National Security Archives? Used to. Used to. Sorry, uh, set it up. Haiti, no, Haiti too. There's no. Uh, there's no. There's no way to check on whether or not the reasons for that invasion. Uh, aside from the safety of some students that were there, but it was the espoused reason, but whether or not the New Jewel movement was really a threat in the way they claim. The documents are just gone. I could see the same thing happening. Secondly, we, in the same vein, we find out that with, with uh, uh, war crimes, that often the documentation that's used is very selective. The defense doesn't get all of it, and the public gets vir virtually none of it. Should we be doing something to make uh, to insist on it. Second question of a, a similar logistic ma matter. Um, just before the Afghan invasion, we learned uh, in Washington, we had a dialogue going on between the media and the intelligence community kind of on a background basis. We learned that there were uh, US uh, journalistic organizations whose credentials were being used to again, once again, cover CIA people. And we complained about it. It was a photojournalist who was not an American, but he had American journalistic credentials. And he was being used to infiltrate him into various situations. We objected to it. They took care of it, they said. And so we raised the question, what about interpreters? What about drivers, fixers, whatnot? And they said, that's your problem. That's not our problem. Those people may well be working not just for the CIA, they might be working for some other intelligence organization. And I'm just wondering, again, do we need to go back and get some assurance that we're not getting what those levels are? Okay, two questions, one second. Okay, good. Um, two questions, first of all, on the question of documents. Hania, would you address that, please? Sure. Um, I think your fears are justified. Um, that's probably the way it's going to go with the documents. Um, there's a huge amount of documents. Um, we've been to visit some places where there's been... Uh, I was in a conference in Paris just before I came here, and I was talking about similar issues, and I likened the, some of the documents that we found in some of the uh, buildings that we visited akin to, um, you know, the hordes of grain in the grain silos of the European um, Union warehouses where you can see these images of just, they were literally like that, mountains of documents that you, in order to approach and have a look at, you literally step on. Um, the CPA itself has a minimum of eight linear miles of documents. I've heard uh, maybe Say up to... Eight linear miles of documents. Eight linear miles. Um, many of these documents have been taken out of the country. They are in Qatar at the moment, uh, being looked at by the Iraq survey group. Um, nobody has access to them. Uh, I presume that they are in the process of being sanitized. Um, I think some of the um, information that will be used, as I think uh, you said, uh, will be very selective. The problem is that if, um, and this is not to mention uh, documents that are being held by other groups, NGOs, political parties, and so on. We did some of the rounds uh, last month when Eric and I um, were looking at this issue. Um, I think there is a problem about um, some documents being secreted away and then eventually be becoming subject to a 30-year rule or something, and we don't know, we may not have access to them for some time. Um, there's no way of knowing. Uh, we've been calling, as a human rights group, we've been calling for all these documents to um, to go under one roof, um, and we had hoped that through the UN that might happen uh, until the attack on the UN happened last August, and that idea um, went down the drain following the killing of Sergio de Mello. But um, there are some efforts to do this, but I think it's very scattered. Um, the, the worrying thing is which documents are going to be used for the trials, if any, and that's also a question and a story by itself, because if the trials start as quickly as the Iraqi Governing Council want them to start, there won't be any time to even look through the documents, and already some, some people are saying, within the Governing Council, are saying, let's go with the existing evidence. Well, the existing evidence, um, we don't know what it is at this point in time, but it certainly wouldn't include um, some of the very important information that might be in those documents. So there's a whole series of issues, and I think as journalists it would be, uh, I think, um, really worthwhile to, to cover some of these issues which are not events that are happening in your face. Um, you know, no, nobody's being blown up 
um, no bomb is going off somewhere, but these are really crucial issues that will affect the trials, and it's, it's just as well for you as journalists to do your homework um, on that in preparation for the trials. Okay, just briefly on Scott's other question. Is your question, should we be worried that our interpreters or, or other staff member are, are CIA plants? Should we demand that the U.S. government not infiltrate people as our interpreters, etc.? Anybody want to address that one briefly? Well, it sounds uh, like a logical extension of the movement over the past couple decades to try to prevent, uh, to try to build a stone wall, a firewall between the press and, and U.S. intelligence agencies. Uh, of course, there, those are practice of, of abuse in the 60s and I think the 70s that now uh, has been largely addressed. But anyway, it sounds logical. I would say, however, uh, that there's a problem not only that we are being utilized by the U.S. intelligence agencies, but indeed by the insurgents. That might be as well. Uh, in fact, the U.S. government, of course, routine, and the, CP, and the um, governing council routinely have accused Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya of being in the pocket of Al Qaeda or the insurgents or any combination of the above. And I think to the governing council's dis great discredit, it has uh, put a lot of restrictions on especially Arabia and Al Jazeera's uh, actions. And they banned them on occasion from uh, CP covering the governing council itself and threatened to throw them out of the country. A lot of very undemocratic actions uh, really attacking the freedom of the press for uh, these Arab channels based on al unproved allegations. And in fact, a lot of them, as employees of Reuters uh, and others, have been imprisoned for days on end and subject to what could be called torture. Uh, very harsh questioning, sleep deprivation, threats, uh, etc. For again for days on end, and m many press freedom organizations have written letters of protest, uh, and Reuters has been very strong in protesting to the U.S. government about the mistreatment of its, popu of its journalists, and of course the killing of its one photographer by uh, Abu Ghraib, uh, November I think it was. Okay, we have a question back here. Yeah, hi, I'm Craig Pies. I do um, a lot of investigative reporting internationally. I have a very simple question, but I just want to respond to Scott's uh, question about uh, whether the, P the local assist people are maybe infiltrated uh, and intelligence assets. I mean, there's no way of really knowing this, and there's no way of, I believe, of really petitioning the United States government and say, please don't report on us, because technically it wouldn't be the United States government that would be doing the reporting, but their local assist groups, like the Iraqi National Congress or whatever, or their, their own groups of intelligence people that infiltrate you, they report to the, um, the local authorities who then report it to U.S. intelligence. I think you just have to assume that you're probably being infiltrated, that people are drawing back two or three paychecks from whatever side. But my question is to Hanya, uh, in that intriguing reference that you made of people that we're overlooking in terms of black pass, are you referring to the Iraqi National Accord and the process and the fight with the INC over debathification? or some other group, and what do you know about that? Well, I was in fact referring to individuals rather than groups. Um, if you want names, I can mention some, because we've, um, we've, we're on public, uh, it's on the public record what we've said about Just these cases. Just give us a couple of names and examples. Well, I mean, the, the former chief of staff of the armed forces, uh, Nizar al-Khazraji, uh, is a man who, um, at the time of the outbreak of this war, uh, was being investigated for war crimes in Denmark, where he had gone some time earlier to ask for political asylum and was denied it. Um, sorry? Where is he? 
Uh, then, yes, then he disappeared, and then um, there were various stories about where he might have popped up, including the Emirates, Damascus, and so on. I'm not sure what the latest is on that right now, um, but he was certainly being courted by some within the CIA um, um, in order to perhaps uh, play um, a role. If you remember at that time, um, one of the issues um, ahead of the war was how do we make contact with some of the Sunni generals and others within Iraq who has the best contacts and some of these guys who I think ought to be before who ought to come before a tribunal were offering those kinds of services um, promising that um, they could deliver uh, segments of the Iraqi army that they had been in contact with before they had themselves fled Iraq. So um, I do remember going to Washington and meeting people from the State Department raising this issue and saying, you know, the U.S. government should be careful about allying themselves with people of this kind. And, you know, once the documents are seized, information is going to come out on these guys and you're going to, it's not going to good look for the, uh, it's not going to look good for the U.S. administration. And the response, uh, who? Is he under indictment in Denmark? Yes. Uh, and the response from the State Department was, well, if the Iraqi opposition doesn't have any problem with them, why should we? Um, and that kind of pretty much summed it up. Uh, there are other examples I could give, but I think okay. uh, we're running out of time. I'm going to take one last question, and then I have a question, and then we'll close this up. One last question. Yes, sir. Thomas, Thomas Friedman, in his comment. Uh, in the New York Times this morning uh, said that we're doing the war on the cheap and we should insert a lot more soldiers uh, in Iraq. So my question is, if we did that, would it alleviate the security situation, which all of you have spoken about, and more importantly from a long-term standpoint, would it help get r Iraq back to a situation that ultimately we hope they'll be in a democratic or a self-governing uh, sovereign nation? Okay, Mark spoke, yeah, go ahead, Theola. Mark spoke to this briefly, Theola, and then Ed. Um, I had lots of conversations with soldiers in my time there, and they would talk about pulling double shifts, working 16 hours, um, not sleeping, and one thing that they always said was, if there were more of us, if we didn't have to stand guard all the time because this building might blow up all day, and then at night go out on raids, and then try to capture Bathus. They felt that they were really, really tapped thin and that, and that they wanted more of their guys on the ground. And I think that's a, um, I think that's a, a sort of plea that, you know, Rumfeld and sort of other people don't sort of talk about. Well, yes, you know, some of the commanders might say, okay, yes, we have enough people, but then the actual guys sort of doing the work say, you know, you want me to do these 20 things and stay alive, and it's just really too much. Okay, Ed and then Mark. Um, I actually didn't cover the military that much, so I'm not sure what military commanders are saying about that. Um, all I know is what, what's obviously on the record from people like General Shinshaki from before the invasion. Um, and I think that in addition, if you want to quell the security situation, what people have told me there is that you also need other factors like um, economic factors, um, political factors. And just by putting more soldiers in there, that's not necessarily the only way to quell the insurgency, if you want to call it that. Um, there's like the concept of, uh, you know, what some people in the military call total war, which isn't um, the traditional sense of total war in terms of like destroying everything, but total war in terms of um, addressing military and political issues. And as Rob pointed out earlier, having people feel enfranchised in the new Iraq, that's not something that putting more soldiers in is necessarily going to solve. And furthermore, I think that in addition, um, I did, haven't read Friedman's commentary today, but his other big thing that he's, um, you know, on the th um, on the podium about is that is the multilateral um, nature of adding more soldiers and the fact that if you add just more American soldiers, will it still look like an American occupation, and will that um, will that raise the ire even more of some Iraqis? Mark. Um, somebody on the Middle Eastern panel this morning said, don't report what leaders say, report what they mean. 
And I, I have to say that I think that the, on the question of troop strength, this is a deeply uncontroversial point at bottom, that the Americans went in very light, even it was very controversial within the military. Shinseki said several hundred thousand troops, not because he picked it out of the air, but because that's what the army thought, most of the army uh, thought were needed um, on the ground. They haven't had enough to secure borders. They haven't had enough troops to secure Baghdad when they got there or, or um, even now. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take the US military's word for it. They've been trying to get in more soldiers uh, from the Pakistanis, uh, from uh, the Turks. Uh, you know, the Turks agreed to send in soldiers, and the insurgents, who've been very clever on this, bombed the Turkish embassy. Uh, they've taken the Americans' isolation as one of their main weaknesses, and methodically, through these bombings, gone on to emphasize and uh, uh, magnify their isolation. So, you know, it's quite true if you got, I mean, you're not going to get more Americans because there aren't any more American troops. Uh, we don't have, you know, one of the great illusions, I think, that Iraq, I wish, would dispel is that America has overwhelming power. America doesn't have overwhelming power, and it didn't, it sent in very few troops to do this operation for political reasons. It now has not enough uh, to add to it, and as Ed just said, the political difficulties of adding to those numbers, not just in Iraq, but in the United States, admitting that they were wrong, are thought to be insurmountable. They can't get troops from other countries because the insurgents, through their use of terrorism, have made that impossible. Um, and the country is now not secure, and that insecurity is undermining the entire occupation, the hopes to impose democracy, or whatever the phrase was, and all of the other political goals uh, of the occupation. Um, and that, it seems to me, is right in front of our face. Robert and then Hania. I think it's a big mistake to view this, the, the Iraqi mess, as primarily a security problem. I think that's not correct. I think it is primarily a political problem, a domestic Iraqi political problem, in that it is a country un that is occupied by what many Iraqis feel is a foreign, uh, alien, hostile force. Uh, it has a local government that has very little legitimacy among its own, pe among the broad Iraqi populace. Uh, the I think simply adding another 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 American troops is not going to make the situation better and in fact will probably, would probably make it worse. If you want to add foreign troops, I say make them Arabic speaking troops uh, from non-neighboring countries. In other words, not Jordan, not Syria, not Saudi Arabia, uh, but say Egypt, uh, Morocco, etc. Uh, and obviously the only way to do that is to go through the UN and to get uh, true UN buy-in and an authority uh, which the Arabs are demanding as a quid pro quo and the Europeans are demanding, everybody's demanding as a quid pro quo, true UN authority over Iraq, not just a little rubber stamp or a little fig leaf, but real authority, uh, not with, without Paul Bremer and company in charge. But which is why the insurgents hit, hit the United Nations twice over the summer, because they anticipated that. Sure, and it's a, it's a vicious circle. But somehow you have to break that circle. You have to break uh, the, the counterinsurgency, insurgency dynamic feeding off itself. And you need a dramatic break, uh, which I certainly have not seen anybody trying to make. See a little, twink, a little uh, fiddling around at the edges, the Bush administration going to the United Nations saying, well, we'd sort of like a new resolution, uh, but not with any real authority, mind you. Uh, we're still going to be in charge. And so uh, the fiddling, uh, the tinkering, uh, I'm afraid, is, is not going to work. OK, Hania, briefly, and then we're, we'll say goodbye. Um, this is on a totally different note. Uh, just to go back to the original um, title of this particular panel, uh, I think, I mean, I only mentioned one example of where uh, there was a missed story by the media. There are others, but there are also other issues that we ourselves, as Human Rights Watch, still haven't dealt with. Um, and, you know, as I said, um, there are so many issues to cover, and it's going to take basically an army to cover them all, and we don't have that right now. But I think, on the whole, um, the press did pretty well in covering human rights issues. I mean, that's from our perspective. Um, there, there have been some major omissions, but you know, there, there have been some really good stories, and um, at some points, particularly in the period before and uh, during the war in the North, 
uh, we were in a very um, unusual situation of being um, surrounded by um, massive amount of journalists who had nothing particular to do or write about because the war had either not started or was going on somewhere else um, in the south. So we found ourselves in a position of being a story uh, in our own right, uh, which is a luxury that we don't often have. So um, we were able to get across a lot of the material that um, we were issuing at that time covered by the press. I mean, some of it was, I think, pretty boring. If I was a journalist, I wouldn't have covered it myself. But, uh, uh, but other issues, I think, were very important, uh, and they were covered. And um, I think despite all the criticisms that have been heard, um, I think we should recognize that increasingly journalists are um, uh, you know, uh, playing that role in terms of um, uh, talking about uh, human rights issues that really matter. And I hope they continue doing that. Orville Schell wants to close this session, but before we go, I'd just like to ask you all to give these wonderful panelists a big hand.